Uh, I love New York. I love R. So uh, you know, this opportunity is um, kind of a match made in heaven for me. Um, and so today, I want to tell everyone uh, why I think that mental health is a field of opportunity uh, for uh, data science and for R and for people who are you know practitioner of these tools. Um, and so my story, how I got here seven years ago, I had uh, zero ability to code. I had no training in computer science or anything. Uh, five years ago, I went to Seattle for a summer. I took this selfie with Hadley, um, and all of my friends in grad school were extremely jealous. About three years ago, I um, founded a mental health company called Spring Health. Um, again, no business degree, uh, you know, uh, probably grossly inappropriate or irresponsible decision of me to found a company. Um, and then a year and a half ago, uh, our company started giving out free mental health care uh, to people who work at companies that we partner with. Huge shout out to Workbench, uh, Jess and John who invested in our A round. Uh, and so Spring Health, uh, our mission is to help individuals and organizations thrive uh, by eliminating every barrier to mental health. Uh, we do that by partnering with companies like those that are listed on the right, uh, all the way from you know, small startups like uh, those in New York, like Zola or MongoDB, uh, all the way up to you know, pretty big companies, 150,000 uh, employee uh, groups like Gap or Whole Foods. Uh, and they pay us to go and give out free mental health care to everyone that works for them. Uh, and they do it uh, because uh, the, the general space of mental health care right now uh, is a little bit broken. Um, uh, it starts out here. This is very uh, long and windy and, and confusing journey, but I, I think it, you'll see why it's important to go through it. Um, it starts out here in the top left. Uh, people feel bad that you know, they're not sure why. They might feel sad or anxious or, or they're not sleeping properly. Um, they're not sure why. Uh, that's because there's a lot of confusion about these conditions. Uh, there's a lot of stigma. People don't really openly talk about it, although that is changing now. Uh, hopefully, you know, they pluck up the courage and they go and seek treatment. Um, the nice thing, at least, about mental health conditions is that most of them are highly treatable. They're all pretty common, but pretty treatable. Um, and, you know, by some extraordinary fortune, some of them actually go and get care. Uh, in the US, it's very, very complicated. Uh, people might not know, they might not have the domain knowledge. They might not know the difference between a psychiatrist and a psychologist and a therapist or a social worker. Uh, they're probably pretty confused about the way that insurance works. Uh, there's, you know, co-pays and deductibles and co-insurance and then things that are in network or out of network and may be accepted or may not be accepted. Uh, this whole process is very confusing, uh, particularly for people who are struggling at the time. But fingers crossed, they go, they see a provider, they get a diagnosis. Uh, and actually, nationally, at that point, about 30% of those people never show up again. Um, those are people who are kind of falling through the cracks. There's many reasons that we're going to touch upon. Um, but let's say that they do you know, start treatment. A uh, provider gives them something like uh, an antidepressant or like a, a course of therapy. Um, and, and what actually happens here, really, is that people go through this process of trial and error while they figure out what works uh, well for them. So, Providers have tons of different things that they can do for you. There's all these different medications. Uh, there are all these different kinds of therapies. Uh, and they do work overall, uh, but what works for one person might not work for another. And so there's this long uh, you know, period of trial and error where people bounce between treatments uh, until they eventually recover, which is a great outcome. You know, there are a few people left at the bottom of this funnel. Uh, but unfortunately, by the end, within one year from that person recovering, uh, about 40% of those people will unfortunately have relapsed um, and be back in a slightly worse position than they started. It sounds bad, right? But it's important to bear in mind things are actually getting better in this space. Um, it was only 80 or 100 years ago where treatment mostly consisted of things like asylums um, and physical restraint was uh, one way that we dealt with mental health conditions. Uh, about 30 to 50 years ago, uh, we kind of had the advent of antidepressants, these medications that reliably uh, will help people feel better, um, different kinds of therapy to help people understand how their thoughts and feelings and uh, behaviors are all related and how we can change that to make it a little bit better. Um, but the, you know, the overall situation today is that we have a bunch of things that kind of work, um, but there's this trial and error process to figure out what's going to work for each individual. And I think that that's going to change, um, at least that's our hope, which is that in some near future, um, we might be in a world where we can be more proactive, we can figure out who's going to have a problem, we can figure out how we can get them connected to care sooner, uh, how we can try and match them with types of treatment that might be more, uh, more likely to work for that person as an individual. And hopefully, uh, we might have a more effective system uh, in total. And I think that it's important to stress that uh, I think that R is going to play a huge part. Uh, R, you know, if, if that's your favorite flavor, but certainly uh, data science more generally is going to play a huge part in that. And so today, I'm just going to highlight uh, in the next 10 minutes or so uh, five examples uh, where R and or data science uh, are improving mental health right now. Um, so uh, parts of that journey that I outlined uh, that are currently being improved um, by 
tools that were developed completely in, uh, in R uh, and, and kind of with data science uh, philosophies behind them. And they'll be across that whole journey that I, uh, that I mentioned. The beginning of that journey, right, had some people who were good uh, and some people who will eventually be bad. Uh, and I think at a high level, it's very uh, important and helpful for us to know which individuals might eventually go on to have to experience some unfortunate outcome. Uh, and so suicide is, is pretty much the most salient uh, that we can pick in mental health. Uh, it's actually the 10th leading cause of death right now in the United States. And so suicide you know, attempts are you know, often fatal, but uh, certainly rare. And so that actually puts providers in a tricky position uh, because they don't know who that they should be worrying about. Uh, they know that they should be worrying because at uh, a uh, grand scale, uh, these things are a big problem, but they don't know who they need to worry about. And so this was some work that was done out in Seattle by the, the University of Washington team and uh, Kaiser, a research group out of Kaiser. Uh, and what they did was they went and linked state death records, so information that the government maintains about who died uh, and how they died, uh, and linked those death records back to the electronic medical record that they have from all of their own health systems uh, to develop a risk prediction model that would tell us how likely each individual person is to eventually go on and have a suicide-related uh, behavior or a, a suicide attempt or you know, maybe a suicide death. Um, but be able to kind of relate that electronic medical record data uh, before that happens uh, to that, you know, future adverse event. Um, they, you know, you, the paper is here in case anyone wants to look into it, um, but they used, uh, you know, R the whole way. Um, they used the GlimNet packet, uh, package to, to fit an elastic net model, which is a, you know, a very powerful and, ex and fast-fitting algorithm. Uh, they used for each to you know, distribute this uh, large workload over many computers or many cores within a computer. Uh, and putting it into production actually is really easy because uh, they can just take the GlimNet coefficients. Uh, it's just actual math. Apparently, people know how to do this. <laughs> and then you can just apply the coefficients to the, back to that passive EMR data. So no one has to do anything. Um, but these algorithms that run in the background uh, are able to tell physicians who they should be worrying about. Uh, and so the top 5% of these risk scores that come out of this algorithm, just based on passive data, actually capture 40%, more than 40% of all uh, future adverse events from this population. So it allows the clinicians to really focus in on just a few people rather than expending resources everywhere. Um, but that sample that they're focusing on uh, is enriched for these bad events. And so we can try and focus on the people who, uh, who are at higher risk uh, of, of having an unfortunate uh, thing, thing that we want to avoid. Uh, I mentioned that when people get that diagnosis, uh, you know, just broadly in the United States, about half of those people never come back. Um, there's tons of reasons why this happens. Um, you know, they might, uh, you know, say that they can't afford the cost. They might not know how it works with their insurance. They might be too busy. Uh, they might be scared that we're going to force them to take medications or commit them to a psychiatric hospital. Um, the tons and tons of reasons why, but very difficult, again, to know what that individual uh, person will see as their own reason why they're not going to get care. And so uh, this is actually work that we did, um, Spring Health, uh, in collaboration with uh, a couple of different universities around the world, Yale, Oxford, uh, and a data science group uh, out in London, where we used uh, that patient's symptoms uh, and sociodemographic profile uh, when they uh, got that diagnosis with the physician and used that uh, to actually rank the reasons why people are, the, those people would be most likely not to get care. So out of all of the possible reasons, uh, come up with some kind of recommendation uh, engine that will tell us or rank the most likely reasons why an individual might not get care. Um, again, you know, R through and through. Uh, XGBoost was the algorithm. It's a, a package for fitting gradient boosted machines. Uh, the whole thing was done in Carrot, uh, which is uh, extremely important to keep yourself sane uh, when, you're, uh, when you're fitting and validating these, uh, these models and streamlining the whole process. Uh, and then we actually developed an open sourced uh, a library that we built ourselves called XGBoost Explainer uh, that is actually clinician facing, um, that helps clinicians understand how a model arrived at a prediction for any one individual. So, uh, you know, if I come in and I'm a, uh, you know, a 35-year-old white male uh, who has symptoms X, Y, and Z, how did the algorithm think about putting all of those pieces together uh, when it decided that I was too busy for care or I was worried about what my boss is going to say uh, if they found out that I got treatment? Um, and again, uh, allows us to do things like anticipate barriers, anticipate the reasons why people might not be willing to go into care, um, and so that we can try and do something about it and tailor that individual's experience in, in the healthcare system uh, so that we can offer them uh, treatment approaches that might be more acceptable or more amenable for them. A uh, third example that I wanted to touch upon uh, was really getting to the heart of this issue of trial and error that goes on in mental health. 
Um, clinicians have all of these different options. There is maybe 50 uh, FDA uh, indicated treatments for, for depression. Uh, there are uh, you know, a bazillion medications. There are all of these different kinds of psychotherapies, uh, different ways that those psychotherapies work. But again, clinician doesn't know upfront what's gonna work for you. Uh, maybe if I go into therapy, maybe I'll have a terrible experience and I'll hate my therapist and I won't get better. Um, and maybe if I actually then go and take Lexapro or something like that, then uh, maybe I'll have a, a very good response. And so um, this was work that we did while I was still back at Yale. Uh, we actually took uh, data from uh, a bunch of pharmaceutical partners uh, from uh, randomized controlled trials that were done either uh, in industry or by CROs, uh, clinical research organizations, or by uh, the National Institute of Health or FDA registration trials, uh, and bring all of those into a common space so that we can train, uh, again, a machine learning algorithm uh, that can predict, given what you look like before treatment, uh, predict what, your, what likely events are gonna happen to you. Uh, are you likely to recover conditional on you taking certain kinds of treatment? Um, again, to train all of this, uh, XG Boost and Carrot gets you a very, very long way. Uh, there may be ways that you can do things slightly better. Um, I think if we did it today, I think that this would probably still give us uh, most of that performance that we got. Um, and in terms of putting it into production, uh, there's a, a package called R in Ruby, uh, which is a, a really helpful binder that helps that uh, allows you to run uh, or to connect um, uh, an R, you know, a, an R evaluator that can receive these uh, receive information about a patient uh, and then return back model predictions and have that communicate with a, a backend server that might be written in Ruby, for example. Um, Again, it's, it's important to bear in mind that the, the technology that we build can make a huge impact on individual patient uh, outcomes. Uh, in this case, we showed in that first paper in The Lancet that's in the, the top right, um, that when people took the treatment that was recommended for them, they were actually two times more likely to get better uh, in that first episode of treatment than if a psychiatrist, even one at a large academic medical center, uh, had made a recommendation based on clinical intuition. The third example that I wanna give um, is not stats heavy. Um, I think uh, it, this is a great example to show like how far you can get uh, with just kind of pure intuition, uh, building, uh, building tools that really can just help clinicians and kind of help the problem uh, without having to rely too heavily on stats or there's no fancy modeling or no fancy stats really going on here. Um, this is an example from uh, the United Kingdom's National Health Service. They have uh, a single payer system in there. Everyone can go and get free treatment from the, the National Health Service. Uh, and they actually use data to set expectations for the patient and for the provider uh, about what uh, treatment success looks like, about what your symptoms are likely to look like as you go into treatment and as you continue treatment. Uh, in this case, what they do is they go and get uh, all of the people that they've treated before in these large registries. They have millions of patients that they've treated uh, over the last you know, five or 10 years or so. Uh, and then they, uh, they use packages like LME4 and NLME for, to fit growth curve models. But uh, really the idea here is that uh, they take all of the people they've ever seen before uh, and then they just plot that back to the clinician, uh, but giving them some guardrails. So we say, um, out of all of the people that we've treated before, this is what the worst 10% of outcomes look like, and this is what the best 10% of outcomes look like. Uh, and then all they do is show you what this patient looks like on their own you know, unique journey, um, and then they'll give you an alert if you ever go outside of those two. So uh, you know, in this case, you can see uh, this patient starts off and it's going okay, but then you know, something happens and then they fall into this, uh, this red zone uh, that is shown back to the clinicians. Uh, and then the clinician is told, hey, you know, this looks like, uh, whatever's going on here, this looks abnormally bad for us. Uh, you know, this is already in the, the worst 10% of outcomes given everything that we know from all of the people that we treat. Uh, and then they give, the, they give that information to the care team and so that the care team can have a conversation amongst themselves and say, hey, do we know what's gone on here? Is there some kind of external reason why this might have happened? Um, or do we need to have a conversation with that patient uh, and let them know, hey, you know, what we're doing right now isn't working. Um, we'd love to have a conversation about uh, different treatment strategies that we could take. Um, you know, we really wanna help get you back on track. Uh, this is a super simple innovation from a data science perspective, right? There's really not that much going on on the modeling side, uh, but the impact can be pretty uh, profound. Uh, so uh, a randomized controlled trial of this approach, this framework, uh, the results of which are shown on the right. Uh, so if you randomize people to, uh, to see the same sets of providers in two different cases, but in one case, uh, they're given this kind of visualization uh, and they're given these heads up on patients that are not recovering. Uh, and on the other side, they're treated by the same people, but without this technology supporting the clinicians, uh, you actually see that uh, failure rates for treatment are actually two times lower if they were given this heads up about um, you know, someone's 
uh, progress not being on track. So a uh, great example uh, of data science done at scale, used every single day in the National Health Service, um, that really didn't depend on, on that sophisticated modeling, but does um, really speak to a, a, pr a pretty fundamental understanding <coughs> of what's going on with that patient uh, and how we can try and give clinicians uh, information that is informative for them uh, and, uh, and helpful also back for the patient. The final example, um, you know, by this point, the, the patients have hopefully all recovered, um, but even after they get better, many of those people will eventually relapse. Uh, it's, you know, an unfortunate truth that many mental health conditions are actually recurring, um, and people will, you know, often uh, dip in and out of uh, good versus bad periods uh, over the course of their life. Uh, but the, the individual journey that one person goes through uh, is quite noisy. Right? If you take this figure on the left, this is what it might look like if you have you know, 200 people and they're all going on their own unique journeys. Uh, and that can actually be pretty challenging, either for a clinician to, to predict up front uh, or for a machine learning model to also try and predict what that individual pathway might look like. And so uh, this was a study done by a biostats group. Uh, they used the LCMM package uh, to fit late, latent class mixture models, uh, which basically say, uh, out of all of the, the different individual journeys that are going on, uh, can we come up with more representative classes, like types of response that people generally go on? Um, uh, you, turns out you can. You look on the right, and you can actually see these uh, uh, somewhat more interpretable outcomes. Uh, and then you can actually try and predict those instead. So a clinician, instead of having to worry about the specific nuances of what that person's uh, journey might look like, would instead just get a heads up saying, this is someone who looks like they're going to maybe follow a, a trajectory that looks generally bad, um, versus this looks like someone who's going to be on a trajectory that looks fairly OK. Um, and then, again, that can be used to allocate resources to the health system. Uh, it can be used to motivate the, the individual patient uh, and help them uh, stay better once they are better. So um, I hope that this talk has, uh, has convinced you. Uh, I think that, R is, uh, that mental health is a, just a, a huge field of opportunity for people who have an R background or a data science background uh, that want to make a difference to individual patients. Um, I think that in, I've shown a bunch of uh, cases where new technology, uh, particularly implemented through R stats, uh, can improve mental health care right now. Uh, not only can they help, but there's actually a ton of different places where we can do a much better job um, it's not just one specific area that's kind of hyper-developed. It really is a greenfield where people can help uh, with many different problems. Uh, and it's not just research and development. Um, we can do this in the real world with real patients. We're doing it right now uh, with tens of thousands of people being treated every day. Um, you know, large health systems are doing this kind of work. There's really a tremendous opportunity for people to do this uh, everywhere. Um, and I, my, my friends from grad school <coughs> made me put this in um, just because uh, the first time I came here I was an attendee and I was in grad school and you know there's anyone who's in grad school knows that, that mental health issues are completely rampant um, and so I, I did have to include some unofficial conclusions uh, the first one of which is that imposter syndrome is extremely real uh, but it's important for everyone to remember that great data science uh, comes from very diverse backgrounds right it doesn't really matter what your experience is um, really all you have to do is pick a problem that you care about uh, and then pursue it kind of relentlessly um, and have the, the the willingness to learn whatever you need to learn to do it uh, installed up packages, uh, tidyverse and carrot uh, really can change your life. It took my life in a very dire different direction. Um, but between those two packages alone, you can actually have a huge impact uh, on the way that healthcare is delivered. Um, there's a, an extreme amount of power just in two simple R packages uh, that help you do uh, a, you know, a tremendous amount uh, with the code that you have. Uh, and I probably owe my own sanity and mental health uh, to Max Kuhn and his colleagues for developing carrot. I said this to him last night. It was very embarrassing uh, over dinner. Um, <laughs> But for sure, I would have gone crazy if I had to learn machine learning without uh, you know, infrastructure and support that helps you be able to do this, uh, do it reproducibly, do it quickly, do it effectively. Uh, yeah, that's everything. Um, we are hiring. If anyone is interested in you know, picking a problem in mental health and then using data to try and make it better, uh, definitely give us a shout. Uh, you can email me, careers at springhealth.com. <laughs>